and welcome to YEP's Know Your Rights panel. My name is Mahalit Bakonin, and today I'll be moderating a Know Your Rights panel, uh, one of a series of uh, Know Your Rights panels YEP will be hosting in partnership with the Ethiopian American Bar Association. Today we have with us Tasfaya Mohammed, who is the board member, one of the board members of the Ethiopian American Bar Association. He is also an attorney. So I will first, before we get started, I will let Tesfai introduce himself and give us a little bit of about his background and we'll dive right in. Tesfai, thank you so much for coming and uh, willing to share your insights about um, legal rights that immigrants have, especially in the DC area, to help our community. So thank you again, and I will kick it to you to give a little bit more of an introduction. Thank you, Mahalet. Uh, my name is Tasfaya Mohammed. I'm an attorney. I focus on real estate law, uh, business, and you know contracts. I also do nonprofits. Uh, these are my my main focus areas. And I also do other stuff, but I mainly concentrate on focus on business, real estate, and nonprofits. Thank you so much. Um, so we will first, the way we will structure this panel is we'll first, for the first few minutes, touch on high level issues, immigrants residing in DC should be aware of before diving into landlord and tenant rights, which is a yeah. very hot topic, especially in the pandemic uh, yeah. era. And then yep, previously conducted a Know Your Rights seminar when dealing with law enforcement, which you can find, I'll put it in the link uh, in the comment now, um, and we'll provide it in, uh, in our resources as well, following up on this panel, um, and you'll find it on the YouTube channel. Again, like I said, this is one of a series of Know Your Rights seminars Yep, we'll be hosting. So we will go ahead and, and uh, uh, kick it off with our, our first question, Tess Faye. Right. In general, based on your experience, what are some basic legal issues immigrants, again, especially those residing in the DC area, which you have experience with, should be aware of when they're operating in the workplace, in their homes, and generally living in their communities? Uh, I think, so I would say they should be aware of at least four areas. Uh, I mean, the, there's so many laws, as you know, in the US, there's so many things that you have to be aware of. But I would say as an immigrant, you should focus on at least three areas, well, four areas. Number one, I would say is no basic immigration laws just basic ones. Uh, number two, I would say no um, basic employment law, specifically basic wage theft laws. Number three, I would say um, no uh, about um, help that is available or assistance that is available to uh, victims of human trafficking, specifically uh, domestic employees, domestic workers. And lastly, I think we'll touch on this later on, is landlord-tenant issues. I believe these four areas affect the immigrant community the most. And I think knowing just the basics about these areas will help them greatly. Um, I mean, if you, I can just explain a little bit about these four areas and why I think they're important. Uh, yeah, the that, that would thing, be helpful, okay, absolutely. That, the first one is obvious, right? Immigration law affects the immigrant community more than any community in this country. Like if you are not immigrant, it almost you know never affects you unless you're bringing in someone from outside of the country. So I do get questions about basic things I think every immigrant should be aware of. Like uh, when can you apply for citizenship, right? after five years and I was you know I'm surprised at how many people do not know that and I think everybody in the immigrant community they should they should know that after five years you can apply for your citizenship and I'm just surprised that so many people just call me and ask me can I apply after seven years you know and after 10 years you have to renew your green card uh, because it expires so five years right away apply um, I'm surprised at how many people ask me who can they bring to the US. 
you know, you can bring your immediate family members. Yeah, you can bring your, you know, your spouse, your mom, dad, uh, and you know, this is basic stuff that everybody should know. But I'm surprised I get a lot of questions about that. You can bring your, you know, your sister, your brother, but that process will take much longer than, you know, if you if it's your spouse and all that stuff. And then uh, the other area that I've noticed, I've, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions on is marriage, right? A lot of immigrant communities, a lot of you know our friends and all that stuff, they go to Ethiopia or wherever to get married and bring their spouse. And I, you know, not many people know this, but you can bring your spouse here to get married through a fiance visa. And once they're here, you can start the process uh, for their immigration card. Um, you can start the process and while the process is ongoing, they can stay here with you. I've seen people where they go there, apply, and they're waiting, you know, years to get their spouses here. So that's why I say, you know, basic immigration rules, everybody should know these things. Uh, the second one, uh, wage theft. Uh, the reason I brought it up is it affects the immigrant community, you know, more than anyone else, any other community. Uh, they're especially victims to it because, uh, you know, especially those that do not have their papers in order, uh, they are afraid to even ask uh, or assert their rights when it comes to uh, getting paid for the work they've done. So wage theft means uh, DC has one of the most progressive wage theft laws. It essentially, what the law entails is if you're employed, your employer has to pay you uh, the minimum uh, wage. Uh, and if you're entitled to other employment benefits, they have to, your employer has to provide that to you. And if they don't, you know, that's considered wage theft. Uh, so in DC, I believe it is 12, 12, 20, 12, I mean, no, $15 and 20 cents. So if your employer is paying you less than that per hour, uh, they're stealing your money. Uh, because if, if you're getting paid $14, that your employer is taking a dollar twenty cents from you every hour. So that's considered wage theft. Um, and the DC takes this type of stuff seriously. Um, and they they have um, an agency or a department that deals with this stuff specifically. Uh, it's called, I believe, uh, DC wage. Uh, Wage, uh, wage employer office, office of wage employer. And if your employer is not paying you, you know, the minimum wage or providing you the benefits, you go and complain to them. You submit a complaint. Um, and if you, they, they want to encourage everybody to submit the complaint. So don't be afraid if, you know, you don't have your immigration papers in order and all of that stuff they don't care about that. And in fact, they've said they don't report people because they want to encourage people to come out and report it because the main victims are people who do not have papers and the employers know about this and they, you know, they pay them less and they think the employers think, you know, you're not going to do anything about it because I'm going to report you to ICE or whatever but they can't do that. That's actually an extortion. You can report that to the DC Office of Wage Employers. And once you report it, the, D the DC is going to find them, uh, recover your money, uh, triple it. So if they didn't pay you a dollar, they have to pay you $3. Um, and they will recover it if, uh, things don't get settled, they will file a lawsuit against the employer. In some other states, it's an, you know, it's actually a, a criminal offense. So you can, as an employer, you can criminal, you can be charged criminally if you don't pay um, the minimum wage or provide other benefits. Uh, the other one is basic human trafficking laws, specifically domestic workers. Um, as, I mean, this is, less frequent than the other two issues, but uh, I've seen examples of where diplomats bring 
you know, uh, domestic workers to the U.S. and they pay them the same amount of money they would pay them back home. Uh, a, a recent example actually in D.C. was, uh, you know, a domestic worker who was brought in by a diplomat and she was getting paid $50 a, a month. And wow. her status to be in the U.S. is tied to the to the um, to the diplomat. So if he says she no longer works for me, she has mm -hmm. to go back. So she was afraid to say anything. And usually they they they're really well guarded. They you know they can't interact with other members of the community that well and all of that stuff. So um, I think that to a lesser extent than others does affect the immigrant community much more. And I think it, it, it's helpful to know what help is available, what where they can turn to. Um, and one of the best organizations in the DC area is called Ayuda. Um, and if you can get, I don't have their number right now, but if you can write it down, get their number. And if anybody calls them, they're really quick to help you. They have lawyers uh, ready to help. The other organization, I have three organizations. So it's Ayuda, uh, Polaris Project, and Family Crisis Center of Montgomery County. So that's in Silver Spring area. Uh, find them, get their number, and just have it in your records. Maybe somebody you know might need it. Just say, tell them, hey, Call this number, explain your situation to them. Um, the other issue I think that affects immigrant communities more, you know, a lot frequently is uh, landlord tenant issues. Um, and we'll talk about that. Landlords are required to comply with the rules and everything, but when they're renting it to immigrants, they don't follow the rules because they think, you know, they're you know, if you're an immigrant, you don't know the rules or you're not even going to go there. So, but we'll talk about that. I think that was long. So sorry about that. That's very, I mean, that's very helpful. I was writing down notes um, <laughs> and all the things that you've highlighted, which, which is true, right? The, one of the reason that Yep uh, is doing uh, this series is that the, the immigrant community is one of the most vulnerable when it comes to um, actually exercising their legal rights because of the host of issues that you've listed um, and also knowing where to go, right? How to, to get the resources that they need. And we will be, all the all the information that Testify provided, we will be pr putting it in our resources and um, also link to it uh, on our website. So we'll, we'll be able to follow up with that. And I do wanna drill in, like you said, um, the main topic today, there's so many, I mean, all the topics that you discussed, we can go on for hours about it and we will focus on it um, in the future. For today, we're focusing on um, landlord, tenant, uh, property rights, right? Um, whether someone is dealing with residential property, commercial real, real estate issues, um, that's something that, especially in the DC area, especially with the Ethiopian American community, where they have multiple businesses as well as uh, own uh, different yeah. um, real estate, uh, that that's an issue that comes up and that you deal with, I know, um, uh, yeah. often. So let's start with trends, and then we'll drill down on some of the issues and how, how to exercise um, your rights when it comes to these issues. So okay. what are the trends that you've experience or you've seen when it comes to immigrants dealing with real estate legal issues and I know that's a big blanket but you can pick and choose you know based on especially during the pandemic I'm, I'm sure you have a story or two to, to tell but if we can start with some of the trends and then we can go on and talk about recommendations both when it comes to landlords as well as tenants. Yeah um I think that in terms of immigrant, immigrant community, especially in the Ethiopian and Eritrean uh, and real estate, I would say landlord is the big one, landlord tenant issues. Uh, and then um, uh, I would say investment in, in properties. Uh, I was surprised at how, uh, how much um, Ethiopians, Eritreans, they invest in properties. And usually when they do it, they do it as a team. So it's like four or five of them get together and buy a property. So 
uh, those two areas, have, you know, those are my experiences. I'm sure there's other issues, but landlord, tenant, and uh, investment, yeah, so, real estate investment. So let's let's start with uh, landlord tenant. What are let's start with landlords. What are some fundamental you know rights that if you are an immigrant that is a landlord or that is considering being a landlord that you should be aware of or any considerations that you you should um, you should think about before going into that business? That's a good question. Um, and I think if you are uh, a property owner and you're thinking about renting the property, there's some basic rules you should be aware of. Um, landlord tenant relationship can get nasty. Uh, I've seen situations where landlords actually lose their property. Uh, they either sell it or they owe a lot of money to the tenant. That's surprising, I know, to the tenant where they have to sell the property and pay the tenant. That, that's an extreme situation. But uh, in these type of situations, things get bad for the landlord who does not know the basic rules mm -hmm. or does not go and consult with someone who knows. Uh, if you know another landlord who's been through this, you know, go talk to them. Don't, you know, don't say this is my house. No, <laughs> you're going to find out that the, the rules are so complicated that it's better to just go consult with an attorney or at least know the basic rules. So one thing, the, the first thing I tell anybody that's thinking about becoming a landlord is number one, especially if you're in DC, register to be a landlord. If you're not registered, like every landlord in DC, if you wanna be a landlord, you have to be registered in DC. And I'm pretty sure another jurisdiction in like Montgomery County or PG County, even in Virginia, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I mean, I don't know about the, the Virginia rules, um, but I'm pretty sure every locality has rules about landlord tenant and whether you have to register. In DC, you, you have to register to be a landlord. There are exemptions where you don't have to, but make sure you get exempt. But what I've seen is a lot of times small time landlords, they're not even registered. That's, you know, you're already violating the rules, you know? So number one, register to be a landlord, register your property. Uh, rule number two, uh, do not, once you've registered your property, uh, do, if you end up fighting with the tenant, unless the tenant leaves voluntarily, do not evict them, you know, by yourself. Do not force them. Do not, you know, do not get your friends to evict them. You have to file a complaint in court. You have to get a court order. And then once you have that order, you know, the sheriff will come and assist you. If the person still does not move, you know, the, the police will come and help you move them out. But if you don't have that paper and you try to evict them, that's really bad. Uh, you, you know, you can get sued, there's damages, punitive damages, attorney's fees, all of this stuff. So what I tell people is do not do it yourself. So don't do self-help. Um, so the other thing is uh, number three, or well, number three I would tell people is make sure the, if you're leasing something to, a t to another person, have it in writing. So have a lease in place. And when you also do not write the lease yourself unless you're like you're a lawyer or something, because some there is your there are rules that you cannot put certain provisions in the lease. So there's illegal provisions and all that stuff. Uh, so you know, just if you are thinking about renting, just go to a lawyer have them um, draft a lease for you and just do it the right way from the start. So, and uh, yeah, the last thing I want to, well, 
that's it. I, I think for now, I think we'll continue. To yeah, I think those are very important points and points that, you know, if you can get anything out of it is make it legal because yes. it will pay off when Ever you encounter something down the line, if you have, if you've gone through the processes to have doc, the proper documentation to co to consult the proper, you know, whether it's an attorney or uh, the city um, in terms of registration, that's very important. So that when you do eventually encounter uh, a problem, you're able to have backup and that you don't have to uh, worry about doing things last minute. Um, so that that's. That's actually something that you mentioned, which really highlights uh, for our purposes in terms of DC and the relevancy of DC laws is uh, DC has tenant friendly, well, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but tenant friendly laws in place uh, yeah. when it comes to landlord tenant relationship, because that's exactly what it is. is it's, a, it's a relationship, it's a, uh, it's a legal relationship. So. How about for tenants, if you wear the, yeah. uh, the tenant cow, what are the things that when they enter the landlord tenant relationship, when they start renting a place, uh, whether it's a house or an apartment, uh, what yeah. are the things that they should be, um, they should consider and, uh, you know, do's and uh, do nots that you, you recommend for tenants? Okay. Um, I think there's a lot of things tenants should know. But if you have to know, well, if you must know, I mean, you, I think two things you have to know, you should know, is number one, uh, DC has what's called Tenant's Bill of Rights. Uh, there's 14, a list of 14 uh, rights that tenants have in DC, and it's actually a law, and they have it in different languages. You can, it's in PDF. You can print it and have it at your house. So they have it in Amharic and in English. Uh, so know that. Like I think you'll be in much better position if you can just go download the DC Tenants Rights Bill and just know what they are. And if you ever get into a dispute with your landlord, go to that Bill of Rights, go through the list and say, did my landlord violate any of this? If the answer is yes, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be bad for the landlord and it's going to be tough for the landlord to evict you. So number one, know what the tenant bill of rights are. There's 14 of them. Uh, number two, the second thing you should know is the DC Office of Tenants Advocate. Uh, and they will, you know, if you get into issues, if you get into problems, if you have any questions, just call them and explain your situation and the land, you know, they, they'll, they'll guide you to the right resources. So I know there's a lot of things you must know as a tenant, but if you, if I could advise you to know the top two things is your bill of rights as a tenant. And number two is the no uh, you know, get the contact for DC Office, Office of the Tenants Advocate. That's uh, very cool. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, even going back to the landlord, I should mm -hmm. have mentioned is know what the tenant's bill of rights is for a landlord and make sure you don't violate any of them. So go through the list and know them and do not violate any of them. And then the other thing I want to, like one, one thing I recommend to landlords whenever they come to me with issues is the first thing I tell them, especially if you're going to be a new landlord, uh, what I tell them is go watch a movie called Pacific Heights. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever seen that movie. <laughs> Not actually. No, yeah. I, I might have to. <laughs> it's a landlord tenant issue. Okay. And it's about, you know, uh, two. It's about a couple who buy a nice property and their plan is to live in it and also rent it. Okay. And they got in, they didn't know the rules and they found out the tough way about you know, how much rights tenants have and they ended up selling the property. So, I mean, the movie is a bit exaggerated, but I, right. I can tell you there's real life stories 
like almost like that. So if you watch that movie, you'll be you're gonna be a lot more cautious. You're gonna you know move you know move forward with what you plan to do more cautiously, and you'll be willing to consult with people who know better, attorneys and all that stuff. So my advice, I mean all of that stuff that I've said. So going to the tenants, um, bill of rights, know what they are. Uh, I mean, I'm, I can highlight them, you know, the maybe two or three out of those bill of rights. Yeah, that would be helpful if you can list a couple of a couple mm -hmm. that you think are key. Um, okay. Obviously, the, no, the bill of rights is long and um, you should always have it handy. Um, it's available mm -hmm. um, on the BC website, but we will also provide that information. But yeah, if you can highlight a couple that you think are, are key uh, yeah. for tenants to know. So number one, you cannot be evicted uh, unless if in even if your lease is over, let's say you sign a lease for a year. So I, one of the bill of rights is eviction. So they say eviction, you cannot be evicted unless it's for failure to pay rent and, or if you violate other provisions of uh, of the lease, right? But if you end, if you fix them, you, you still cannot be evicted. You can stay there you know, uh, until you want to leave. So eviction, so you, the landlord cannot just evict you because, you know, they want to have the property right. uh, or they cannot evict you because they don't like you. Um, they, if they decide to evict you first, they have to give you notice and they have to specify what the reason is for the eviction. And if they, one, one of the main reasons they can evict you is if you don't pay. So as long as you're paying, it's gonna be almost impossible for them to evict you. Uh, if they can evict you, if you violate some provision in the lease, uh, let's say an example is the lease says you cannot have a dog, right? Right. And you end up having a dog, they can evict you for that, but first they have to give you notice at least 30 days, give you opportunity to fix to you know fix whatever violation. And if you fix that, they cannot evict you. So if you have, if the lease says no dogs and you have a dog, you remove it, they can't evict you. So I think that's important to know. Um, yeah, the other thing is if your landlord wants to sell the property, it's uh, so that. The second thing I would like them to know is TOPA, what's called Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. So if you're a tenant and <clears throat> the landlord wants to sell the property, uh, they first, first they have to offer it to you. They have to come to you and say, hey, I'm planning to sell this property. <clears throat> I want to sell it for this much. And would you like to buy it? So they have to give you first offer. Uh, I they have uh, this, I think, used to apply for single, multi, and, you know, apartments mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I think they they did get rid of the single for single families, single family homes. So if you live in a single family home, TOPA does not apply to you. But if you live in a multi-unit home, uh, multi-unit multi, multi -unit property, they have to offer it to you. and you can sell, you know, you, you can buy it or you can sell the right to another person. So what tenants end up doing, if they can't afford it or if they don't want to buy it, I've seen tenants where they sell that right to another person for money. So they collect mm -hmm. maybe 10,000 and mm -hmm. sell the right so another person could buy it. So that's second thing. Uh, that I think another important thing to mention is security deposit in DC. Mm -hmm. You uh, in DC, the the landlord, the most the landlord can request is uh, one month. It cannot be more than a month's uh, security deposit. So, um, yeah. No, those are those are important, especially. I mean, notice is critical and I think a lot of uh, folks don't know that especially if they don't know the laws in place it, they they defer to the landlord if they 
um, are violating some something in the in the contract, they would think they automatically have to to leave the premises and based on um, oral notice. And so um, there's that opportunity to correct. You have that right to correct um, uh, what you violated. So uh, that's a really good point that you raised. And one thing that I also want to talk about is, so given that we're in the middle of a pandemic, is how the pandemic has affected these rights, right? A lot of people don't know, especially a lot of uh, uh, tenants, whether they're business business tenants, uh, you know, DC has a high population of Ethiopian businesses. Not all of them own the properties that they reside in. So yeah. they were uh, unfortunately greatly impacted by the pandemic, unable to pay for rent and uh, had to navigate that. So I know certain things have changed um, as we're coming or it seems like we're coming out of the pandemic. So any tips uh, for these businesses as they navigate the pandemic, post-pandemic world? Yeah, um, I think uh, there was more protection during the pandemic. The, the DC City Council pa passed a lot of protection, protecting mm -hmm. tenants uh, during the pandemic. And do, uh, that, so one of the protection was you cannot evict a tenant. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, especially if a tenant meets certain requirements. Um, so there wasn't any, I would say it wasn't a lot, there was an attempt at eviction, but I don't think people were evicted because there was eviction moratorium. There was a ban on evictions during that time. And they kept expanding it, extending the date. Uh, but I think the last date was January 1st. So right. landlords could not evict you uh, until the, the, earl the earliest they could start the eviction process, which was January 1st, 2021. Um, they haven't extended that. So as of right now, we're in February 19th, 20, what is it, 19th, 20th? <laughs> uh, yes, 20th. Uh, yeah. So, so that's February, been, you can be evicted so now. You can. And one of the things that, you know, I'm sure, uh, uh, that you, you've seen is that just because they can't evict you doesn't mean that you owe that the rent that that is due right once that yeah. that expiration date so uh, yeah. it could be um at this point they don't have the protection that they had during the pandemic so yeah, yeah. Are their recourses? Um, so that i mean the other thing is if for businesses um you can have I don't know if it's gonna work, or whatever. But I mean, these businesses have less protection than residential. You know, residential landlord tenant rules are different from commercial landlord tenant rules. So if you're a business and you're renting a space, you have much less protection. Uh, you know, when I say the Bill of Rights, it doesn't apply to commercial tenants. So those are not your rights, right? Uh, and obviously, that's very important to know, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't don't go tell your landlord, hey, my bill of rights. It doesn't. <laughs> so, and the reason is businesses. If you are, if you, you know, if you open a business, you you can afford, you know, legal advice. You don't need that much protection. Uh, you're more sophisticated. If you open a business. You, you're more sophisticated, you, you, you can afford to go hire a lawyer and all this stuff. So th they're not gonna provide you more protection. Um, but if you're a residential tenant, you need that protection. You need more protection from uh, the government and all that stuff. So, but that being said, it doesn't mean, you know, you don't have some way out of whatever calamity befall, you know, befell on you. So leases are contracts and there's, you know, there's defenses to non-performance that say if you didn't pay your rent, you know, if, if it was because of the pandemic, you know, the government forced you to, to close your business. You can, I think you, there is a good argument you can make that you're excused, you don't have to perform and, you know, you don't have to pay your landlord because of this. So, I would say talk to a lawyer if you're facing yeah. that kind of situations. 
talk to an attorney like testify uh, yeah. because that's very no that really is I think uh, key is that the fees that you pay for an attorney and if you can't afford an attorney there are other resources that yeah. you can seek out but it's very important that as testify highlighted these are contracts and you can you can find counsel to work through these contracts and and find a way um, to to make sure that um, your business is, is protected uh, and that it, you can move forward. So um, don't lose hope just because you don't see that these bill of rights don't apply to you as, as a commercial or as a business yeah. tenant. So that that's a very important. Um, you know, if you take away anything out of this, it's uh, when in doubt seek legal counsel, um, and um, and your life will be a whole lot easier. So I want to end this with final th thoughts that you have for, for the audience. Obviously we can talk about these laws for hours. Uh, there's a, they can get complex and yeah. um, you are not expected to know this um, while running a business or while, while working two, two jobs. And it's a, it can be a lot. So that's why we're here. We're here to provide you resources. We will link to what Testify highlighted today. And we will also include uh, testifies contact information if you need legal counsel um, uh, and uh, obviously yep is here for to, to assist you in uh, whatever troubles you're going through and and recommend uh, resources to the best of our ability so with that I want to uh, give you the opportunity to testify to uh, give us some final thoughts uh, as uh, folks take away uh, from this session as well as the sessions that we will will, will follow in, in the near future. All right. Um, one thing I think you should take away from this, especially if you're a tenant, is you know know the Bill of Rights for tenants. Know the Bill of Rights. Number two, there's a lot of help for tenants, especially if you cannot afford an attorney. Uh, you know, there's a lot of assistance out there. And the reason I told you the second thing as, an, as a tenant you should know is the DC of, uh, Office of Tenants Advocate. They will refer you to other organizations that provide tenants with help. And I, even not, so even normal attorneys might be willing, might be willing to take your case for free especially if the landlord has violated some, some provisions of the, of, your, of the Bill of Rights, right? If they think the case is good, they will take your case for free and force the landlord to pay their attorney's fees. So one of the things that both tenant and landlord should be aware of is uh, the, the statute that you know, landlord tenant statute, there's a provision that provides for attorney's fees. So if a landlord is in violation, um, has, you know, done something wrong, then they may be forced to pay the tenant's attorney also. So, I've, you know, there are law firms out there that actually want you as a tenant to go to them and they won't, you know, you know they'll provide the legal services for free. So familiarize yourself with the Bill of Rights, know the DC Office of Tenants Advocate and get their number. And if there's any issue, call them and say, hey, can you refer me to some place? So, and for landlords, what I'll tell you is, watch that movie I recommended. <laughs> yeah, Pacific Heights, number two, if you're in DC, register your home, right? You know, register to be a landlord. If you're not, and things go south, it's you, you, you know it's really bad for you. I would say. And then um, know the tenant bill of rights and do not violate them. And if you can afford it, I mean, I think if you're trying to be a landlord, you can just go to an attorney, have them draft you the lease, and you know have them advise you if you're starting out the right. That's what I wanted. That's Thank what I you. wanted. That's that's very that's very helpful. This has been 
Um, I'm definitely watching that movie. <laughs> um, this, is, this has been very enlightening. Uh, we really, yep, appreciate your time, Tess Bay. Uh, and uh, this is something that, as we said in the beginning, uh, one of a series of Know Your Rights events that YEP will be hosting. We appreciate the European American Bar Association for uh, their partnership. And um, we will also be including a contact information link for you all um, in our description so that you can fill out your contact information and we will provide you updates on future events as well as resources, uh, some of which that Tesfaye listed today in our session. So thank you, Tesfaye. Thank you all for um, attending and uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next Know Your Rights panel. Thank you for having me.